Welcome back 2021ers. This lecture will begin our discussion of virtual memory. A couple of logistics items. Note that this lecture will be a little bit standalone, that we won't resume discussion of virtual memory until a week from now. That's post exam three. And none of the content of this lecture is to appear on that exam. This week, as usual, we'll spend Wednesday doing a review, and I'll have a practice exam for you along with some lab review exercises and a short review homework. And on Friday, be prepared for exam three, which will look back at our discussion of optimization, architecture, and memory system and tie all of those together to see if you've been tracking what's going on. Keep in mind also that good preparation for the exam is to work on project four. It is due a week from now in, on Monday. Uh, to that end, our goals for today are to introduce this idea of the virtual address space associated with programs. This is covered in Brighton and HowlRound in Chapter 9. It's covered there in some detail, and we'll survey some of that now. Be working on the project, uh, be reviewing and preparing those uh, for exam three, and also, if you get the chance, make sure to keep up with this virtual memory discussion. It's uh, not necessarily something that you can control directly in a lot of cases, uh, such as was the case with the memory system and hardware, but it is informative of lots of things that go on in computing systems. The first thing that we need to resolve is to pose a little bit of a mystery and see if we can come up with a way that uh, you can understand a computing system uh, and how it sort of works around this issue. Um, so to that end, uh, we'll introduce a mildly new term known as a process. And all this is is a running program. Uh, and all of you know that if you compile something in GCC, for instance, and then run it, uh, that A dot out, it takes on a life. It lives for a while. And when the program's done executing, it uh, dies and goes away. Uh, you also know that if you have one A dot out, you can actually start a whole bunch of instances of that running. Uh, just as you're running your own GCC, you'll probably have friends and neighbors if you're logged into a group machine like Atlas. Uh, running several machine, uh, several instances of GCC, and a lot of folks will be running their benchmarks at the same time. Uh, at no point have you ever really considered the possibility that your programs could be messing up other programs or vice versa. And this is somewhat interesting, as you would recall, most programs have four areas of memory, and it would be good uh, to, at this point to recall what those four areas are. Um, these are sort of roughly divided into sections uh, that his, have historical and modern significance. Um, we'll go through that in a second. But uh, importantly, I want to recall uh, one of them, and it will be a giveaway, uh, that there is a global area of memory. And suppose you have two different programs. And, this is just for the sake of argument. You could indeed run the same program and with generate the same problem. Uh, but they both make use of some global variable that happens to be at memory address 1024. Uh, and the program one you see is an assembly instruction that moves from global memory uh, one, at, at address 1024 into register REX. You'll have to remember that in the Intel x86 nomenclature for assembly, this 1024 here is a raw memory address, not a constant. So this is go fetch whatever is at memory address 1024 and move it into register RAX. At nearly the same time, you have this program 2 that is also making use of memory address 1024. Uh, it is adding on the contents of ESI uh, into the whatever is contained in memory address 1024. Now pause for just a moment and consider, do these two pro uh, programs have a problem? Are they going to step on each other's feet uh, somehow? And if so, and this is by far the more complex problem, how would you resolve such a conflict? What mechanism would you introduce into a computing system that would prevent any uh, foot stepping, as it were here? Take just a moment and consider this, because we have not thus far, and things more or less we've gotten away with, but uh, this could be signs of trouble to come. All right, for those of you who are tracking at home, the problem here is going to be that both these programs, if they're using memory address 1024, can potentially affect each other. Uh, example, if this movement of 
the data from 1024 uh, happens to go before the program to instruction that adds something onto it, uh, then this register rex will get loaded up with something. Uh, versus if the add instruction happens first, then this register rex is probably going to get loaded up with something else. Example, uh, if there's the value 10 in rax, and this instruction executes first, uh, sorry, if there's a value 10 at memory address 1024, uh, then I get a 10 in rex here. But if ESI in this program contains five and I do the addition first, then now at 1024, there was 10, now it's 15, and I load a 15 in here. That means if program one executes slightly ahead of program two, then you get different results in program one. And this is highly undesirable in just about every situation. There are a variety of ways that you might go about trying to prevent this kind of a conflict from happening. Uh, the first and simplest is just don't let program one and program two run at the same time. Uh, they have to be sort of mutually exclusive. And this certainly isn't a problem in programming systems where only one program is running at a time, but none of us are really interested in using those computing systems uh, for our laptops or phones or anything like that, because it means you can only do one thing at a time, and uh, this really cripples, uh, cripples our ability to get work done uh, and enjoy uh, the benefits of uh, multitasking operating systems. There have been a few other historical solutions. Uh, for instance, arranging so that when you would load program one, uh, it, it happens to get memory disk 1024, program two would be loaded at a different location in memory, so it never would actually have a global that could be at 1024. This puts a lot of pressure on the compiler to generate instructions that uh, would allow this program to sort of run in that spot. And to alleviate pressure from that, there's been a sequence of hardware introduced to, to make that job somewhat easier, uh, segmenting and so forth. And this is where the term segmentation fault actually comes from, that uh, different programs are assigned different segments of memory. Gradually, uh, this has evolved into what we now know of as a virtual memory system. Uh, and to sort of underscore the, the problems here of both programs thinking they um, own memory address 1024, you can see again, reiterated here, an order here where uh, 1024 is loaded and ESI uh, is then added uh, onto it uh, versus uh, in the other ordering, like we'd get uh, other answers over there. Um, so we've alluded to some of the solutions here, uh, but this virtual memory system, it's going to turn out, is going to translate every memory address or access that a program makes while it runs on the fly to someplace else, to someplace different than what it thinks of as memory address 1024. Now this has uh, some severe ramifications, uh, but before we get to those, uh, just a quick mention, the four areas of memory that we've talked about so far, uh, function call stack, uh, the heap associated with malloc,ing globals, and text instructions, these are more or less artificial divisions that are introduced by humans to make it easier to manage this stuff. And they all exist in sort of this big linear space uh, that programs reside in. Traditionally, this was in physical memory, but we'll find out uh, relatively quickly here that where you think your program stack starts and where you think the values you've stored in the heap uh, exist, these are actually a virtual address, and it's more or less a lie uh, that the OS and the hardware collaborates on uh, to make it easier for your program to sort of think it owns the whole machine, while behind the scenes, the operating system and the hardware actually manage all of this stuff. So that end, we're going to talk about something called paged memory now. Uh, before we get to the virtual part, uh, this is an important stepping stone uh, to get to understanding that. The physical memory that you have when you buy a big DRAM chip that has 2 or 4 or 16 gigabytes on it, it's typically divided into hunks. And these are called pages to try and re sort of reflect this image of a page of paper. Uh, and if you think of uh, taking notes on pieces of paper, uh, then you would take notes maybe from the top of the page down to the bottom. If you realize in the middle of this that you're missing something, uh, then you might have to erase the bottom half of this uh, and add that missing element in and then scrawl and copy the rest of the stuff down. Um, this sort of inconvenient. Uh, however, if you have several pages of this memory and decide, oh, between page and one and two, uh, I actually needed a second page uh, to plop down, I can actually, in a three-ring binder or other sort of you know page-friendly uh, medium to hold of it, uh, just 
turn page one over and plop down a blank page in between uh, pages one and two. Uh, page two now becomes page three and you've got something blank in the, in the piece. Uh, the main thing here then is that memory, by virtue of it dividing up into these hunks, uh, allows you to then sort of treat each hunk as this separate entity uh, and it'll be the case that the operating system keep tracks of virtual pages and how they map to physical pages. If that feels a little esoteric right now, uh, just wait a second. We'll um, get some uh, pictures on the page <laughs> uh, in just a minute. Uh, for the moment, uh, consider, though, that you have to pick a size for pages. And by far the most common page size that uh, modern computing systems use is 4 kilobytes, or 4,096 bytes. Uh, let's see, if I remember right, uh, 2 to the 10th, that's 1,024. Uh, 2 to the 11th, uh, that is uh, 2048. And 2 to the 12th, that's 4096 uh, by a progressive doubling. Yeah, uh, so I see over here 12 bits uh, for that. Uh, that means with 12 bits, you could determine any byte within this 4096 block. Uh, and that'll be an important facet that we talk about as we move ahead. Uh, you can get different sizes of pages. Uh, however, the hardware and the operating system need to collaborate on it just a little bit. Uh, so beware of that and know that it'll be an operating system level uh, setting that you have to adjust there. Uh, by default on all the systems that I think you'll encounter, you'll see 4KB uh, used. So that 12 bits business uh, means that in a particular address, if you knock off 12 bits, uh, then you'll have some bits remaining. Uh, for instance, if you had 64 bits and you knock 12 bits off, uh, then there'd be 52 pages left, or uh, sorry, 52 bits left. Uh, and we'll come to know the remainder of that address as some sort of a page number. Uh, the last 12 bits then are used to index into the page itself. Uh, we'll see a picture of that in just a moment. Uh, I should mention that despite the use of 64-bit systems these days, uh, and we've talked about 64 bits, that's what can hold a pointer, or refer to sort of memory address, it turns out that uh, all 64 bits aren't actually used uh, for addresses. Uh, that instead, the, usually that 64 bits, the uppermost uh, pattern uh, that's present in them has to be some fixed set of bits, like uh, all zeros or all ones or some combination thereof to be considered valid. Uh, otherwise, the OS will just uh, claim invalid uh, stuff there. Uh, and instead, most processes only support, at this point at any rate, uh, some number of bits associated with a physical address and a slightly larger address associated with uh, virtual addresses. And we'll distinguish those two um, and, and not too long. Uh, so that means that in a 64-bit pointer, you can expect some of the upper bits uh, to just be held fixed, uh, that they don't actually matter much. Uh, but getting them to be the right pattern will be important to get valid memory addresses. Okay, uh, so to that end, if you have 48 bits then that are honored by the processor uh, and to sort of the upper four or five or so uh, aren't actually honored by the operating system uh, associated with what you can actually fit in a, uh, a virtual address, uh, if you knock off those 12 associated with how big a page is, then you've got 36 bits uh, for a page number. And we'll talk about this quantity uh, sort of post-exam as really, really enormous. Uh, this is a lot, a lot of pages. Uh, and even with only 48 bits here, we're still able to specify gobs and gobs of memory, about terabytes of, of memory, uh, far beyond what you'd get in any realistic desktop system at the moment at any rate. To give you some more concreteness then, um, here are some quasi pictures, or at least tables, uh, to start to sort of lay out what this looks like. Um, that out there, there is this notion of physical pages of, of memory. Uh, and in RAM, a page might have a sort of a page number that looks something like this thing, uh, or a different page number that looks like this thing. You can see based on those physical page numbers, these are very like dis. Con, um, sort of discontinuous uh, that over here this page uh, is not close at all in main memory and physical memory uh, to uh, the others. Uh, you'll notice down at the bottom uh, that the bottom uh, bits for this are actually all zeros and if you count four bits per hexadecimal digit here that's four eight uh, 12 bits, those are the bottom uh, parts down here, and uh, this memory address then with all zeros at the bottom three digits comprises the start of a new page in physical memory. 
Now on the left hand side, uh, we're going to get used to this notion of a virtual page. And this is an imaginary address and it's one that your program actually sees. So at some point you might say, hey, show me the address for this stack variable. And if it happens to line up at the beginning of the page, you might see an address that looks like this. If you go 4,096 bytes down, and if you have a big enough stack, this isn't out of the question, uh, then you'd find here's the beginning of the next page. And the tick up here is A to B uh, down here. Uh, and this difference then, uh, being 4,096 bytes, uh, these two are adjacent pages in virtual memory, at least. And what we'll find that the operating system uses a table like this uh, for every process that's running to say that your virtual page uh, ending in 7A 000, uh, it starts in physical memory at this uh, page that starts with 5649555. Uh, but if you were to move on uh, to the next page of memory, it actually maps to a very different spot, uh, ending in 7B00, uh, maps to someplace much earlier in physical RAM, uh, starting in 321E4, etc. The way this looks then in uh, program is that if this sort of page that starts at 7A000 uh, is an array of a bunch of characters uh, and I start adding on the thing at this address and then the thing at this address and the thing at this address. All of these things are contiguous in physical memory uh, because uh, these 4096 bytes here in virtual memory, uh, the start of this page maps to the start of this uh, physical page and everything in here in the virtual addresses maps to the equivalent sort of offset within that physical page uh, to the offset from the beginning of the virtual virtual page. Uh, that goes right up to uh, AFFF, uh, and that's byte offset 4095. Uh, this is still within that same physical page. But as soon as I go one byte further uh, to what appears to be a contiguous address uh, in physical space or in uh, the virtual space, uh, then this actually will trigger the operating system to translate any addresses in uh, virtual space to a different physical location entirely. Uh, so B000 uh, here uh, translates to this spot starting at 321E46, etc., etc. You notice the 000 is down here. The start of this page aligns with the start of this page, uh, but then starts ticking up again at single byte offsets. Now this is just two pages, and most programs have a whole lot more than two pages. Uh, and uh, an address space that is linear, but much larger uh, than the one that we're seeing here. There are a bunch of things that we'll have to resolve on this, uh, but uh, the first thing I want to mention on this front is that if addresses are going to be translated in this fashion, like every single address that the processor spits out to access some part of main memory, then this translation process has to go fast. Uh, and to that end, there is dedicated hardware to make it go fast. Usually on the CPU chip itself, there's a region that's associated with the memory management unit. Uh, and this is an area of circuitry whose sole purpose is to translate addresses that are coming out of the rest of the CPU uh, into physical addresses. So the virtual address, uh, in this case, that the CPU is requesting load what's at memory address 4100, uh, this will be translated into a page address of four. Uh, so if this is, sorry, a virtual address or virtual page 4100 on then this translates to virtual address 4. Uh, this process happens so often that it makes sense for the MMU to have its own dedicated cache of I just looked up memory address 4100. Uh, it took me a little bit of time to figure out it's at page 4 and we'll talk about how it figures that out. Uh, but in order to make the next lookup address of that address 4100 uh, faster, it'll typically store the results in this translation look aside buffer. Fancy name for a cache that's associated with the memory management unit uh, that makes it possible to uh, look up more quickly addresses that have recently been accessed. This goes in line with those principles of caching that we discussed earlier on uh, the principle of locality, uh, both spatial, uh, so that as I would use this page address, uh, it's very likely I'll access other things on this page, so they're all grouped together, uh, and temporal locality, that the fact that I looked this thing up uh, relatively recently means I'll probably look it up again in the near future, makes sense to cache that result.
Uh, to that end, then, this TLB will make the process go a lot faster, uh, but the MMU uh, needs a way to look up where exactly is it uh, that uh, this address translation should resolve 4100 to If it's not in cache, there has to be a secondary store for this. And this is typically the page table do uh, data structure that we've started to allude to. You go back one uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, one slide here, uh, and you'll see the page table is going to comprised primarily of this thing up top of the OS will track for this virtual page. This is the physical page at which I stored stuff. And for this other virtual page, this is the physical page at which I stored stuff. Uh, notice the continuousness over here and this discontinuities over here. Uh, so the OS has the liberty to map uh, these pages despite being adjacent in virtual space to whatever uh, uh, sort of physical space it wants. Uh, that means then that as the MMU couldn't find something in its translation lookup aside buffer. The next place it would look for is in the page table. Um, so we will uh, discuss then finally if it can't find it in the TLB and can't find it in the page table, uh, then this triggers what's known as a page fault and the operating system takes some special actions then. One of which is something you're all familiar with, uh, the dreaded segmentation fault. Uh, we'll get to that in uh, just a few minutes. So the picture then that is developing is one of the following, uh, that if every process out there has its own page table, this gives the operating system a lot of flexibility to map these pages in virtual space for a program that's running a process uh, to wherever it wants. A little diagram over here is meant to start to convince you of this fact. Here we have three different programs running. Uh, one's called, uh, or sorry, I guess I don't have names for them, but they usually have IDs called process IDs or PIDs, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, the yellow, the blue, and the green programs uh, running more or less simultaneously. Uh, may not be that they're occupying this different CPUs at exactly the same time, but they're all sharing the computing system at once. You can see that each of these thinks it has up to four pages of memory. And the four pages here is pretty paltry, uh, that any real computing system would have many more than that. Uh, but for the moment, it's uh, small enough to fit in a page and large enough to give us a sense of, of what the sort of overarching picture in the operating system is. So if you consider, for instance, uh, this yellow uh, process up here, process one, two, three, its uh, zeroth page is not actually mapped, that its page table reads null, as in uh, this doesn't map to any physical page at the moment. Uh, page 1, that's uh, 4,096 bytes off of it, starting at byte 4,096, uh, maps uh, not to physical page 1, uh, but instead to physical page 2. And you'll note the little notation here, one of the things that the page table stores is, is this page in RAM or is it elsewhere? Uh, and the 2 here indicates if it's in RAM, here's the physical page that, that uh, is storing the data for this uh, program. If you zip down just a little ways, uh, the other RAM page that this has uh, is at zero. So it's actually before, uh, in physical memory, uh, this earlier virtual address. And so these things are all sort of discoordinated, that going in sort of order in memory here can jump all over the place on the right-hand side. The other thing that this uh, sort of gives as an indication is that another common spot that the operating system will store memory is actually in disk. And we alluded to this earlier, and it was sort of a head scratcher, but here it is now. Uh, so the combined sort of memory footprint of all three of these programs would be 12 pages of RAM. Uh, even if you knocked out the one page, of, uh, the zeroth address that each of them is uh, uh, not mapped at the moment, and uh, that will leaving you with nine pages, uh, and then knocked out this other page that isn't being uh, mapped in uh, process 456, uh, that would still leave you with eight pages of memory. That's twice the RAM uh, that we have over here. And if you were trying to run all these programs at once and didn't have the setup that you see over here, then probably uh, you couldn't start one of them with the OS just reporting you couldn't find memory for it. Instead, most OSs can be configured to use a so-called swap space. This is to use part of the disk down here, which is much larger uh, because you get more gigabytes per dollar spent and also much slower, uh, but uh, can use this as sort of backup for memory. 
And so as I've been running process uh, 123, it appears to the OS that this page 2 here, it hasn't been used for a while, so the OS has opted to swap it down to disk location 5 down here. Uh, this frees up some of the RAM it would be using otherwise uh, for others to use. And you can see here page 1 in physical memory is actually being used uh, down here uh, by, let's see, sorry, uh, as uh, the third page in the cyan process ID 456, uh, and its page 1 is up here uh, mapped to physical location 3. Uh, finally, then, uh, poor process 789 down here is mostly in disk, uh, as in page 1 and page 3 are over here on disk, uh, and has one paltry page up here in RAM. Uh, one in other interesting thing this is starting to allude to is that this sort of funny coloring for D here is meant to reflect the fact that two different processes, uh, number one, or sorry, process 456 and process 789, are both pointing to it. And this is going to enable them to share a piece of memory, uh, that they can actually at both access this. Now the whole point of this was to try to avoid such situations unless you can be sure that they're not dangerous. And we'll talk about situations in which this is actually not dangerous at all. Uh, start thinking about that at the moment. A few things to mention then. Uh, the general protocol that happens during the translation of a address in virtual space uh, to its physical location follows something like uh, this, that as a virtual address is being used, uh, the MMU will search its TLB and determine uh, whether it's recently looked that up and so finds the DRAM address in the TLB or not. If you get a hit in the TLB, then you get nearly instantaneous translation uh, and can go out to physical RAM and find the item that you're looking for. Uh, note that this you know, still takes some time, uh, that as you would be looking things up, uh, the TLB is used to figure out uh, where is it exactly and then potentially uh, go through caches uh, of memory and then farther out to L3 caches and then farther out to uh, main memory at that point. Varies a little bit on uh, where the TLB is invoked, uh, whether you're, it's invoked to look up in cache or only when you're going out to main memory. That's an architecture specific detail that we're not going to dwell on too much. At any rate, if you get a miss in this TLB, as in haven't recently translated the DRAM address, then the MMU as a hardware unit is usually able to, uh, parallel to whatever else the processor is doing, look this up in the page table data structure to determine uh, if this thing that you're looking for is in DRAM. And so, for instance, uh, if process ID 123 was looking up uh, something that was in the... Uh, it's, a sort of virtual address for page one, uh, then the MMU would either find it in the TLB or look it up in the page table and find that, ah, this is mapped to RAM address uh, two. So I'll go over here into DRAM uh, and grab this C value out, uh, or potentially uh, some smaller part of it uh, than the whole page in that frame. Uh, if this misses both in the TLB uh, and in the page table, and that no DRAM address can be found for it, then this triggers what's known as a page fault. And this would occur, for instance, as the translation of virtual address uh, for page two here is happening in process one, two, three. This is actually mapped down to disk. Uh, this page fault then will kick control out of the program uh, and into the operating system so it can sort out what uh, is going to happen next. Uh, first and foremost, it'll look to see, well, was this a page fault because I was responsible for swapping it out to disk? And if so, it would take uh, this thing that's requested for uh, the process ID 123, uh, this J value up here, and then figure out uh, which of these items up here it can evict so that it can make space for J. The eviction would probably take uh, some item up here, move it down into uh, the swap space in the disk, and then copy J up here into some DRAM element. Pretend for a moment that it's going to go up here to this B spot. So it's going to overwrite B uh, with J. And that means that uh, I'll have to copy B down maybe to this fifth spot. Uh, and that means any play who is using that spot, uh, this B spot up here, now for instance, will have their page table adjusted to say, oh, you have been evicted. You're now down here in disk instead. So later on when process 456 gets a chance to run, uh, it will have to look down in disk instead and probably evict something else up here. So this is what can typically happen if the OS has swapped out a piece of information that the program eventually needs, and we will talk about that in just a second. 
The other possibility is if, for instance, uh, process 4056 uh, was trying to access what was at its virtual page 2. And you can see there is no mapping for this. At that point, since the uh, MMU would fail and trigger one of these page faults, the operating system would decide, you know, this is not actually my fault. I have never actually given you anything at this page. This is a segmentation fault, and I'll send your program a signal and eventually shut it down and kill it. Uh, to that end, this starts to explain some of the mystery behind how it is the OS knows when your program's going out of its bounds, uh, when it's accessing memory. And it also explains why when you would be accessing null pointers, which are usually memory address zero, that page is almost never mapped to anything. And therefore, your program, as it would attempt to, attempt to for instance, dereference a null pointer, would be accessing page zero, and the OS would fall into one of these page faults and trigger a segmentation fault for your program. A few other things uh, to mention uh, and reiterate on this front. Uh, so first and foremost, this page table data structure, it exists for every running program. And to that end, it'll be important that we develop an efficient mechanism to store this kind of information. The table structure that we have here looks appealing at first until you realize how many pages you're actually going to have to store and how few of them uh, are actually mapped in most cases. So we'll discuss that in some more detail uh, in the not too distant future, probably the next lecture. Uh, the second thing uh, to mention on this is that processes actually sort of compete for RAM in this respect. Uh, that if you don't have a ton of main memory on your system, you can see these processes are constantly going to be fighting each other to get the pieces of data that they want in here uh, into RAM so that uh, they can operate reasonably well. This can lead to a phenomenon known as thrashing, uh, where you have a couple very large memory programs uh, and one evicts the memory of one in order while it gets its turn, uh, takes a few steps, then gets put on hold by the operating system, only to pick up another program who's been mostly evicted and has to bring all of its stuff back in, writing this stuff into disk. Uh, if you have an older disk drive that is one of these spinning varieties, you'll know this starts happening because your CPU spins up to 100%, the disk starts going nuts, uh, and everything grinds to a halt on your program, uh, or on your, sorry, on your screen, because all that's really happening happening is a couple programs or one program is fighting to try and move things constantly between disk and RAM because it's using too much memory. The swap space down here is something that's configurable generally in the operating system. In fact, you can even turn it off, uh, but that means you are potentially going to get this problem that as you would uh, sort of load up too many programs, you may get out of memory errors and you can't start them uh, on that front. Uh, to that end, uh, take care that you don't overburden your system uh, for fear of chattering disks and lost data on that front. This swapping business bears a little bit of mention because some of you may have had the um, sort of practical experience that looks uh, some, something like this. Um, so the virtual memory system then, if your processor supports up to 2 to the 48th of bytes, uh, that's hundreds of terabytes of, of, of memory. Uh, this has to map down to a few hundreds of gigabytes at most, and most of us can only afford, you know, 16 or uh, 32 gigabytes of uh, DRAM. Uh, you can find someplace in your system settings how much you have. So it's very typical for the operating system to use disk space uh, for this part. Uh, if you get into the habit of starting some program to do some quote work, end quote, uh, and then maybe get a little distracted, uh, for instance, uh, bopping over to web browser to check what's on social media, or in my case, watch endless streams of YouTube videos, Find yourself a few hours later uh, with 41 tabs open and realizing it's very late and you haven't yet recorded a video for your students yet, uh, then you might find that your system, as you switch back to that slide deck or report or bit of code that you were working on, suddenly grinds to a halt. And this is because the typical uh, eviction policy that OSs use is whatever has least recently been used gets evicted from DRAM and swapped out to, to disk instead. Uh, that means programs that were started but then sort of left to their own while other programs that were doing things uh, with seemed to need the DRAM uh, from the operating system's perspective, uh, they gobbled up all of the main memory and everything that the 
sort of work program that you'd started initially uh, had in DRAM gotten written out to disk. Uh, and this will take some time then as it sort of herks and jerks like back to life as some of those tabs that were opened, uh, they get evicted, uh, cleaned out from memory or written to disk uh, and the stuff that was swapped out gets brought back in. Uh, eventually all of you will have this uh, problem of uh, disk shattering or uh, CPU spinning as it furiously tries to copy things back into DRAM. Just be patient on that front bit. You know, uh, the OS is fairly arrived and will get things back sort of into working order, although chunk along for a little while. It's worthwhile to state at this point with the sort of big picture associated with virtual memory on the table uh, that it is widely used because it has a number of redeeming features, but it's not without some drawbacks. Uh, so in the win category over here, it avoids this problem that motivated us originally. That's two processes, two programs can be running and they both can be using memory address 1024 and there won't be a conflict because in truth, both of them think they have a 1024, but the OS is actually responsible for mapping that address to someplace else in physical memory and can thereby avoid conflicting. So process one thinks it has 1024 and its 1024 is actually at uh, memory address 10,000. And process two thinks it also has a memory address 1024. Uh, and the OS is uh, opted to map that 1024 for process two to 25,000 instead. This ability of the operating system then to map things wherever it needs creates a tremendous amount of flexibility for it. Uh, and this goes not just for avoiding conflicts, but also for allocating more memory as a process wants it, uh, detecting things like going out of bounds, uh, making use of more sort of virtual memory than the system has in terms of physical memory uh, supporting by employing disk space, uh, and various other sorts of uh, tweaks and uh, niceties associated with virtual memory. It's widely used out there. One of the losses, though, that we'll come to understand is that address translation itself, while in most cases is fast, is not always fast. And it's uh, unpredictably not order one anymore, not constant anymore. And we'll see that you have to look this up in a table at times. And uh, because the tables can get enormously large if we're not careful, and then we'll need to use some clever data structure for that that have a tree-like structure to them, uh, leading to some logarithmic performances. If you're tremendously interested in this, uh, there was a paper published a few years back uh, that talks about uh, the sort of mild logarithmic effects uh, you get working on big data uh, due to virtual memory. It's nothing to that you probably sort of negates the problems that, that are solved through use of virtual memory, but it is interesting to know that there's a tiny, tiny performance hit associated with it. Uh, aside from that, you also need special hardware to make this go, because uh, while with the special hardware you get near O1 performance, without it you'd be hosed, that this just could never be made to run fast enough. So most processors, including Intel and AMD chips, they come built in with a memory management unit and TLB was sort of on chip with the processor, uh, intimately sort of intertwined with it. Uh, there may be uh, in history some examples of a processor and then between it's in the memory system, a standalone MMU and TLB that could be sort of, sort of swapped in and swapped out. But those days are gone these days that mainly MMUs come baked into processors themselves. So generally, though, uh, if you don't want uh, to ex you know, spend a lot of money on a processor, then you may get one without one of these MMUs and TLBs. And there are lots of systems out there where they're only running a single program. The sharing is really what is enabled by this virtual memory system. And on small embedded devices that don't have an operating system and don't share because their sole purpose in the world is to keep the analog brakes from uh, jamming up, uh, there makes it makes no sense to have sort of fancy virtual memory and memory management units and so forth in systems like that. Those embedded microcontrollers uh, tend to not. So generally for most of our um, sort of widely used computing systems, your phones, your laptops, uh, your desktops, your servers, uh, the winds of virtual memory way, way outweigh uh, the losses. And so uh, this is considered one of the great ideas in modern computing systems. Uh, and I just find it hilarious that uh, one of the great ideas in computer science is to lie to programs constantly, that every address of your program is ever gonna see is gonna be a virtual address instead of a physical address.
So the rest of our discussion is going to touch on various aspects of virtual memory, including uh, some of the interesting data structures uh, that are at stake in it. And after that, we'll touch on some of the conveniences and advantages it provides uh, once the OS sort of knows about it and uh, is able to do it. Uh, so we've already talked about this caching feature uh, of virtual memory. And we'll talk some more about the security features uh, as we go forwards. Uh, debugging is tied up in uh, the sort of notion of sharing of data here. And one of the interesting tricks that Valgrind uses uh, is to take the program that it, you want to sort of inspect and load it, but load it in a way that it maps some of its virtual memory to other spots uh, that Valgrind has an easier time checking on. Uh, we saw an allusion to the fact that uh, you can share data between processes and programs uh, making use of this virtual memory system. Uh, we'll maybe have a chance to touch on that. Uh, and also talk a little bit on the sharing of uh, code through shared libraries, something we'll wrap this semester up with uh, relatively soon when we discuss linking, uh, and also uh, this convenience that is memory mapped uh, uh, IO, which will serve as a counterpart to the sort of basic uh, reading and writing functionalities that mo most OSs provide. That should do us for the moment. In case you are curious, uh, there are a few review exercises associated with this deck of slides. Uh, and so take a moment if you uh, can answer the following questions. And I'm going to be kind of a jerk this time on the video. I'm not actually going to put the answers up. So you have to download the slides and find them for yourself. I hope everyone is happy and healthy and hope to see you in lecture sometime this week. Until I do, happy hacking.